Hey everybody, my name is Steven and welcome back to the Storytime channel. Without wasting any time, let's get into our stories of the day. Malicious Compliance for a Math Teacher Who Failed Me the Year Before, aka the last time he asked me to show more work. This story is kind of long because the malicious compliance was the result of over a year of frustration and anger and the effects are still present 10 plus years later. I was your typical obnoxious teen my freshman year of high school. I was smart but had an unstable home life that contributed to my poor decision making. Despite my lack of learning and hard work, I had always, barely, passed my classes. My first year in high school I had math for my first period. I enjoyed math but frustrated my teacher by rarely doing my work and even less frequently showing my work. As the year progressed I fell behind like I did in every class. The second half of the year started and I fell further behind in class and more annoyed with my math teacher. I would typically submit about 10% of each assignment and expect about 10% credit, but because I did not show enough work, he would dock me down to 5%. Despite always being polite, I may have been a sucky student but I couldn't stand disruptive or impolite students. My feelings towards him were obvious and when I tried to talk to him about my assignments, it was clear he was also annoyed with me. About three months before the end of the year, my sister developed senioritis, which affected me because she was my ride to school. For those who don't know, senioritis is when senior students know they are done with high school. Either they know they are going to pass their classes or they've been accepted to college, etc. So they stop caring. Instead of being good students, they decided to do the bare minimum because at this point, nothing in high school really matters. She did not want to go to her first period class, so she started ditching, resulting in me ditching. Initially, I opposed it, but as my frustration with my math teacher increased, so did my absences. Towards the end of the year, I thought I had time to catch up when my teacher ended up reaching his limit. He was frustrated with me and my absences and lack of work that when I was so behind, I had no hope of passing. He got me removed from his class for the remainder of the year. I ended up in study hall detention for the last three weeks. I had to repeat the course the following year instead of over summer school because it was an honors class. This resulted in me having a weird schedule because classes were only offered during certain periods for certain grades and I was a sophomore with freshman classes. I might have also failed honors science. Despite knowing those restrictions, both me and my math teacher were surprised to find that I was placed in his class for the second year in a row. Both of us tried to have me transferred out of his class, but for me to graduate on time, there were no other options. The humiliation of my previous year was enough to make me feel incredibly motivated. I was determined to do well enough that even if he hated me, he could not have me removed again. I made sure to do every problem for every assignment and turn them in on time. Despite all my effort, my grades were mediocre. My teacher only gave one point for the correct answer, but typically five to seven points for work and he marked me down all the time. I talked to him, argued that I showed enough work for him to follow, but no matter what I tried, all he would do was to tell me to show more work. A large part of the reason I hated showing work was because I had terrible handwriting. I previously went to a school that required all of our writing to be done in cursive, so I spent years only writing in cursive. I actually enjoyed writing in cursive and my cursive is beautiful. When we moved for my dad's job, my new school district gave cursive assignments automatic zeros because they were too hard to read. So after years of writing in cursive assuming I'd never need to print again, I now had to print everything and my handwriting never recovered. As a result, to submit legible assignments, I tried to write as little as possible. My handwriting is still ugly. After my grade on the first test did not match what I felt I earned, my frustration grew into outright hostility. It seemed that no amount of hard work would get me a good grade. I finally decided that if I was going to be miserable, I would make my teacher miserable too. After trying to spare him the atrocity that was my handwriting, I finally decided to comply. If he wanted to see more of my work, I would show him all the work. No more would I remove confusing and ugly work, 
No longer would I erase incorrect attempts scribbled across the page because my handwriting was so bad I couldn't write straight. No longer would I rewrite only the relevant work in easy to follow columns. I would write so much work it would be obscene. I started writing out every single possible step, one by one with labels. If I messed up, I would leave it and rewrite it somewhere else. On every worksheet, I would run out of the allotted room and cram my remaining work into the margins because he did not believe in scrap paper. My assignments went from a few formulas and legible bits of work to cluttered nightmares. Every bit of white space was filled, often spilling onto the back of the paper because there was not any room left. Homework assignments went from being 2 to 3 pages to 10 to 15 pages, sometimes more. All my assignments were just pages and pages of nearly illegible, ugly, chaotic work. I figured it would take a month of this before he broke and asked me to write less because reading and grading it was such a chore. About three weeks in, I got my first assignment back. It was higher than any other grade I had received in his class. I was a little shocked but figured he did not have the time to be annoyed yet. During the following week, all the assignments I received were scored similarly. Then he finished grading the second test and asked me to come talk to me about my grade. I was preparing my speech about malicious compliance as I sat down in the chair by his desk but decided to wait for him to speak first. He handed me my test. It was covered in chaotic work, equations, and letters all over. At the top was 100%. I was stunned into silence. I had never gotten a perfect score on a real test before. My teacher began to talk to me about how impressed he had been with my work lately. He pointed out how even though my work was chaotic, it showed my thought process. He also pointed out some of the times where I caught my own mistakes mid-problem and corrected myself and how on previous assignments, I had been doing the same thing. He talked about how before I wrote so little that I typically never recovered once I made a mistake. He told me that this is why he did not allow scrap paper. He wanted us to be able to see our mistakes and work as we progress through our problems. I sat in the chair in shock. I had sat in that chair many times previous, typically to try and debate with him over my scores. I also sat in that chair when he told me half a year prior that I had no hope for passing his class. I sat in the chair of someone I had despised for over a year as he complimented me and told me that he always knew I was capable and he struggled to watch me fail. He talked about how happy he was to see my progress and basically that he knew I would do well once I stopped making stupid mistakes. I wrote down all the steps to annoy my teacher and prove him wrong and he learned instead that I was being a bad student. I learned it is easy to make a simple mistake that can lead to the wrong answer, but when you see your work it helps you think clearly and catch simple mistakes. By the end of the year, I had one of the highest grades in the class. Home life was still crap, and when we did group work, many people wanted to work with me. The math teacher and I became friends. I learned he lived in my neighborhood and would visit him sometimes when I came back to town years later. And he ended up as my favorite teacher of all time. I'm in my last semester of college. Took 10 years because life is crazy. And after this semester, I will graduate as an engineer. I have used this lesson every day for every assignment and would have never have made it if I had not tried to punish my teacher with malicious compliance. This is definitely one of the most inspirational malicious compliance stories I've ever read. Have any of you guys ever had a favorite teacher of yours that left a lasting impression on you like this? If so, let me know in the comments down below, I want to hear your stories. Use these words in a sentence. Junior year, English class, terrible teacher. The kind that makes test questions with multiple correct answers. The kind that grades your essays on whether she agrees with you or not. Prelude 1. Write a short story using the vocabulary words. I did, and she said it wasn't creative enough. What the freak, lady? It's a vocabulary exercise. You are literally determining the content of the story for me. Prelude 2. Write an essay about what we learned from Insert Class Project here. You know the kind, where one person does the work and everyone else gets the grade. So I wrote in the essay that I learned that other people are unreliable and I should cover my own butt. Got an F. Apparently I wasn't supposed to learn that. 
The main event, another vocabulary assignment, this one is the ever useless, use these words in a sentence assignment. I was tired of this teacher and her habit of giving meaningless assignments and then holding you accountable when you failed to meet her unstated preconceptions of what it was. You know where this is going. I took the assignment literally and used all 10 words in a sentence. A sentence. As in one sentence. It was a grand sentence, grammatically correct to the best of my ability. Naturally, I no longer remember it, but it involved many commas, several parentheticals, and at least one semicolon. It wasn't pretty, but it was in fact grammatically correct. Well, mostly, it was certainly a bit of a run-on. I turned it in. What is this? This isn't what I asked for. Actually, it literally is. You'd think an English teacher would understand English. This is stupid and insulting. Do it again, but use a separate sentence for each word this time. Let the games begin. Class wasn't over, but almost, so whatever I did, it had to be fast. I decided to make it as simple as possible. I would use each word in its own separate sentence, but each one would be the simplest sentence possible that both used the vocabulary word and was about a boat. It was beautiful. If the word was an adjective, it describes the boat. The boat was vainglorious. If it was a noun, it was in the boat. The decanter was in the boat. If it was a verb, the boat was doing it. The boat was levitating. If it was an adverb, again with the boat. The boat was floating vicariously. Turned it in at the last possible minute. Made it right to the door before I hear the outburst. You can't be serious. Got a zero on the assignment and was reassigned as homework. Never did do it. Not long after that, I got my GED, but my parents wanted me to finish the school year. I set to work failing the class. And by failing, I mean getting an absolute zero. Even the worst student will, by random chance, occasionally get questions right. Getting an absolute zero means knowing the correct answer and deliberately never giving it. You want to know what insulting is, teacher? Insulting is knowing that your student could be getting a perfect grade but is choosing not to. Obviously, I got an F in that class. Of my high school career, it's the grade I'm most proud of. Went on and started at college the next year. They accepted my GED and never even asked to see my old grade. I would say getting an absolute zero is a harder challenge than getting a 100% because I feel like at some point there's got to be questions that you don't know the answer to and you kind of have to wing it and I feel like you're bound to at least get like one question right somewhere and end up with like a 1%. Just a small one that cheered up my boss. Small backstory. I worked at my local superstore for about two and a half months after coming back to my hometown to isolate with my family during the global pandemic. I used to work there until September last year when I went to university and they asked me to come back and work because they could hire me quickly and I didn't need any training on anything. For reference, I worked on the dot com department. We did all of the home food deliveries and the average order numbers had tripled since the start of the lockdown. Okay, to the story. I come into work one morning and it's a record day. We've never had this many items to pick in the history of the department. Around 25,000 items to collect from the shop floor by noon. So, understandably, my boss is kind of losing every part of his mind because A. We don't have the staff and B. We've never picked anywhere near this many items before. So, work starts and it's understandably crazy. This is where I have to explain a little bit about the way the department works slash is laid out. The dot com staff re-split into two teams. Team 1 is the picking staff, between 15 to 35 people depending on how busy it was. Team 2 was the turnaround staff. We were 3 to 4 people, usually 3 unless it was super busy. But after someone had finished their pick, usually between 80 to 120 items, they would return the full trolley to the dot com section of the warehouse and the turnaround crew would, in this order, empty the full trays out onto a dolly, refill the trolley with empty trays, put the stickers on the trays showing the order number, etc. Now, I would usually be filling the empty trolleys with trays, 
I was faster than anyone else at it so I always ended up doing it for the entire shift. But the stacks of empty trays were lined up against the side wall of the department. Two stacks to a dolly and seven dollies lined up against the wall ready to be used. Now the important part here is that I have these organized so that there is a front and a back stack of trays. With one being further from the wall than the other. And I always use the front stack and then the back stack on one dolly. Then I move to the next dolly working front to back as usual. I'm the only one who does this, everyone else takes the front stack of each dolly, then goes all the way back and starts using the back stacks. Okay, so on this day I go and take my 30 minutes break and when I come back, predictably every single front stack of trays is empty, leaving only the back ones there which annoys me. So my boss comes back into the room at this point and the following exchange occurs. Boss says, hey OP, can you go get another four dollies of trays and condense these half stacks? Yeah, sure, but wouldn't it be easier if I just used all of these and then refilled the entire wall? Rather than spending the time to move a few hundred trays for no reason? I don't know. Actually, I do. Go and get seven dollies, but just get the front. You're kidding, right? Yeah, of course I am. Just go get the darn trays. Me walks out of the room with a little smirk on my face. Cut to three minutes later. Me walks in pulling two dollies of trays, but just the front stack. Seriously? Yep. Boss drops pen and starts to laugh. Dude, why did you just get the fronts? How long did that take you? Long enough. Oh yeah, and we need some trays now. I only brought the fronts. It doesn't sound that funny when I typed it, but it seemed to cheer up my boss. Oh yeah, and we finished on time that day. And we made almost 300,000 British pounds worth of food deliveries that week. This was maybe a month and a half ago. And each week we've made more money than the entire rest of the store combined. Needless to say, my boss is getting a very nice raise after this is over. If you're on the good side of the attitude of the boss and you're making the boss a lot of money, I think you're going to be okay. And with that being said, that's all the stories we have for today, so what I want to know is which of these stories that I've read for you today are your personal favorite and why? Let me know in the comments section down below. And thank you all so very much for watching and listening to the Storytime channel today. If you haven't yet, please consider subscribing and don't forget to turn notifications on so you'll never miss an upcoming video. Thank you all again for watching and listening to the Storytime channel.